Once again, MJ Melendez is changing up his stance at the play. Do we think it's going to lead to more success? I'll tell you next on Locked on Royals. You are Locked on Royals, your daily Kansas City Royals podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are tuning to another edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host, Jack Johnson, and you can give me a follow on Twitter or X at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. It's also very easy to find us on wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Odyssey. We're also on YouTube. Just be sure to hit that follow button and subscribe. And if you are listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, We want to make sure those ratings continue to go up. So if you haven't had the chance to, maybe give us five stars if you really like it and leave a comment as to why you like this podcast. If there's things you want us to work on, feel free to leave it in there. I'm not going to tell you to leave five stars, but if you really like it, that would really help us over here and trying to boost the podcast, make it really good, get into that, you know, four and a half to five star territory. uh, So we can really feel good about building this thing up to as big as it possibly can be. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Of course, we've got a lot of postseason action right around the corner in college hoops, both women's and men's side. Uh, You know, NBA is getting closer and closer to the playoffs. Still a couple months away, but there's a lot of games you can bet on right now and no better place to do it than over at FanDuel. We've got a great code to give you. Uh, If you've never heard us give that code before and you've never signed up for FanDuel, I would keep listening, listening throughout this podcast so you can make sure to win you a lot of money when putting down some bets. If you're a first-time listener, of course, welcome in. We love new listeners here on the Locked On Royals channel. If you want to know a little bit more about me, I work in Kansas City at Sports Radio 810 WHB once a week. I got a show over there, and then uh, five days a week, I've got a show on ESPN Kansas City. So if you ever want my thoughts on things that may not always pertain to Major League Baseball or the Royals, Very easy to check me out over there as I talk a lot of college hoops, college football, NBA football, baseball as well. But you know when you come to this podcast, as a lot of people have over the past few months to this entire offseason, even the tail end of last year, you're getting 30 straight men Royals baseball. And it feels good that in three weeks, a little over three weeks, it's going to be the real deal. That we're going to be talking about this team in a capacity where Everything matters. It's the regular season. Wins and losses start counting. Stats start becoming a real deal. And it's going to be that approach of, you know, it's do or die time now. I know it's a long season. It's a, you know, it's a marathon. You don't want to sprint through a marathon, but you got to pace yourself. And I think everybody has talked themselves up to this level of expectation and what they're wanting from the Royals. And that's going to be a fun time for us here on Uh, this podcast, that we can start talking about things that are real, that it's not just spring training talk of, you know, this guy looks really good, but it's spring training. This guy is performing really well, but it's spring training. Home runs, RBIs, you know, strikeouts for pitchers, ERA, none of it really matters. None of it really matters at the end of the day, as long as these guys stay healthy. Um, And if you've listened long enough during spring training, we were down there in the surprise And I had the chance to interview a lot of the guys. And, you know, it feels like the best approach to take, which I know I sound like I'm I'm beating a dead horse here, but the best approach you want to take is, of course, health. But how these guys look, what adjustments they're making, you know, if they're hitting the ball incredibly hard, if, if you can see little things, bits and pieces here and there as to why it could lead to more success. And, you know, it caught my eye last night, actually, as the Royals were posting some of their highlights from their 7-3 to win over Cincinnati on Sunday. Uh, Michael Walker got the start. Seth Lugo started four against Cleveland in a 13-12 to shootout. The Royals won, of course. Uh, so the Royals, uh, like they typically do in spring training, they're winning a lot of games. But I know for a lot of people, it doesn't matter to you. What matters to you is what some of these guys look like. And what caught my eye was MJ Melendez. And he homered in this game. He's been relatively impressive, I would say, in spring training. His OPS is north of 1.000. So you look at a guy that is 
channeling that power a little bit down in surprise. The, the weather can boost that. The park can boost that. But it's better than the alternative of not just hitting at all. But I'm not even really focused on the home run he had. I'm not really focused on the batting average that he has or the OPS or the WRC plus or even the hard hit rate. It's not something that I am fixating on. What caught my eye was his stance. Um, I, I kind of went back and watched some MJ film on Sunday night and, and tried to identify if what I was seeing was significant enough, if it was even worth mentioning. And we all remember that in the second half, MJ Melendez and Alex Zumwalt said they had made a little bit of an adjustment and it made him one of the better hitters in the lineup. His WRC plus was in the 120s. His OBP was north of 340. He was hitting the ball with a lot more power, hitting the ball harder. He's in the 96th percentile in that range. So there's a lot of people, which is why I've always been on the, the Melendez train. There's been a lot of people that just rule him out as being a, a terrible hitter and a terrible defender. I, I can understand the defensive part of it, but multiple times before he's had to make that switch from a catcher to the outfield. And he had to do that mid season. It wasn't like he had an entire off season of becoming outfielder. That's been this year. So I'd expect him to get a little bit better in that area. Offensively though, I didn't think it was as bad as people were making it out to be. Maybe it's because your expectation of MJ Melendez was really, really high. And maybe I'm talking you into a, a mindset of, wow, he's got to be really good now. I'm not saying he's going to be one of the best hitters in the American League, but I think there's a lot of things that he's developed that have made him better. And that being that coachable, being that teachable, when you are struggling, that's an important part of it. Some guys will be stubborn and say, hey, I got to this level doing what I do. I'm not going to change it. But MJ's been constantly willing to change it, even after having that success, right, uh, of – changing where his hand placement was. It wasn't resting on his shoulder. It was a little bit higher, so he had that elevation. But still, he had the open stance, still had the high leg kick. I noticed a significant change in his stance in the highlights they showed in spring training. His bat is very much vertical now. It's more uh, out across his body, over the plate. And, you know, the swing, the load, the follow-through, which this may sit well or not sit well with a lot of people, it reminds me of Lysmer's swing. But not so much of the, the level swing that Hosmer had. It's got a little bit more lift to it, which a lot of people, if you've watched Eric Hosmer or watched him in his career, you wanted him to lift the ball more. You wanted him to generate more of that torque upward than beating the ball on the ground. But Hosmer was still a time all-star. He's a World Series champion, gold glover. I, I mean, I don't think Eric Hosmer would trade his career for much. I think he did just fine and got paid a boatload of money uh, for putting up good numbers in Kansas City. I'm not going to be one of those guys that picks apart his offensive numbers because he hit a lot of ground balls. But MJ's overall stance, follow-through load, reminded me a little bit of that. But also that I wonder if almost Alex Zumo and Keone Duren got in the lab a little bit with him and said, dude, this really made you feel a difference of you know taking the bat off your shoulder. Because uh, I think we've, if you've played baseball before, you've all had to tinker a little bit with how you – you swung, you know, maybe if you were an open stance, a closed stance, if you had a high leg kick, you just generated power from a weight shift. You know, a lot of different guys would go about changing their swing in a different way. But I think it's very interesting when guys have success and they still tinker with it a little bit more. And I got to say the swing looks good. Spring has been good for him, but that hand placement, it, it is very noticeable to me. I mean, we've gone from it resting on his shoulder to completely out in front of the plate, not in the way that like Matt Olson has it, um, not in the way that Jason Kipnis used to have it. But even I remember with Eric Hosmer, he talked about changing his his stance a little bit, and he brought up Jason Kipnis, if I'm not mistaken, of it just kind of, it already puts your hands back there. So then instead of having it on your shoulder and going through like a batting tutorial right here, which isn't very helpful to people listening, but if your bat's on your shoulder, and then you're loading backwards, you have to take it off your shoulder and back. Whereas if it's already back there and it's high, you're not really moving your hands that much. You're just having a weight transfer back a little bit and then going through and kind of having that torque. So to me, that can generate some power. I think it's a good thing. And so far in spring training, he's had a little bit of that. It sounds like he's been hitting the ball hard. We can't see every single bat because, of course, Major League Baseball has made it very difficult to have the, you know, the spring training look of that. 
and get the spring training breakdowns and, and the stat cast and the highlights. We don't get that on a full scope. So we're kind of left to just hearing about it. But today it was very impressive. But I, I walked away from that thinking that's interesting uh, that he had a lot of success. Let's I want to make that point clear. A lot of success in the second half to to most people. It's not going to matter because the Royals weren't in competitive games. But I've always you know, brought the point of why were we so unbelievably in love with Bobby Wood Jr. second half, as great as it was, right? He got MVP votes. MJ Melendez did. But Bobby Wood Jr. struggled in the first half. And then we took into account his second half, and it's like, this guy's going to be a star. He's going to be a star. Yes, he will be. I'm not trying to knock down Bobby Wood Jr. from a pedestal. But MJ had a very good second half. And a lot of people who dispute the fact to me are like, those games didn't matter. Well, let's see if he can do it in, in April and May. Well, yeah, I think that's the obvious thing here. He's got to do it from the beginning. But those numbers are important for a young hitter, a guy that's trying to make it in this league. I know what success can look like. I know what the comfortability feels like. But even if I am comfortable, I'm going to continue to change things and tinker with things to make sure I'm the best possible version of myself. And maybe it does help MJ Melendez in the long run, but a noticeable change in his stance. And maybe that can help him to get off to a hot start in April. Okay, we're going to take our first break of the show. When we come back, let's recap Seth Lugo and Michael Walker's starts, their second starts of spring training. That's next on Locked On Royals. You are tuned into Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. Be sure to give me a follow on Twitter or X at JohnnyJ underscore 15. And leave us a review on wherever you listen on your podcast, Spotify, Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, Google Podcast, Odyssey, and we're on YouTube. Just be sure to hit that follow button and subscribe. Before we move on to our next segment, want to give a shout out to our title sponsor today in FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NBA. And March Madness, of course, as I've continued to tease over the last couple of weeks, we know that is coming up for a lot of college hoops fans. That's exciting. And that may be your time to start betting on those prop bets, to start betting on winners, to put your futures bet down as to who will win the national championship. Or if you want to do it with baseball too, nobody's going to stop you. I brought up that Cole Reagan's has top 10 Cy Young odds. That should be pretty intriguing for Royals fans. And Bobby Wood Jr., the odds that he has, top 10 as well to win the MVP. Maybe you want to throw $5 or down, $5 down on that or or something. But I can tell you this, if you win that $5 bet by using our code of locked on, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, you can get $150 in bonus bets. So then you're just using all of that to win even more money. So lots of great stuff over at FanDuel. But be sure to use our code of Locked On so you can win a lot of money throughout this college basketball and NBA season and leading you in to the Major League Baseball season. So go and create your FanDuel account today. Well, over the weekend, the Royals did have three starts from their top three guys in the rotation. Cole Reagans went on Friday. It was ridiculous. Um, As we brought up in our mailbag Friday, it was a a typical Cole Reagans start. I mean, throwing triple digits, lots of strikeouts, and nobody could really put a good swing on him. Didn't have any problems issuing walks. Yeah, that was Cole Reagans' Friday in three innings. Seth Lugo went on Saturday, and it wasn't like Cole Reagans. It was not a good start. He snapped the the glorious 12-inning scoreless streak by the Royals' rotation. And what I kind of walked away with it is... I'm sure he was working on things. Now, I don't want to be the the hypocrite of telling you when things are good and then when things aren't good, I go, oh, it doesn't matter. It's spring training. I'm trying to keep that level base of it doesn't really matter what the numbers look like. You just hope that things look pretty good. And actually, David Lesky, so go su- subscribe to him on Inside the Crown, does great work, has great stuff that he goes through with his articles. And he was down there in surprise. Had the chance to see Seth Lugo start. Had the chance to see Michael Walker start. And Seth Lugo was pumping 96. So, again, he gives up five runs and I think, two innings. They had the, the funny spring training rule where you can pull a starter, or any pitcher for that matter, in one inning. 
and then you can bring them back out even if they are relieved from the game Uh, because there's always the pitch count you want to work with. So if Seth Lugo, Matt Quattrero is looking at him and saying, okay, I'd rather him start again with a clean inning and kind of work out of the stretch again and not have to constantly be dealing with base runs. But he wasn't good. Uh, It was not a good start. Uh, He was hit around. The command was not very good. But like I've, I've said, veterans struggling in spring training is maybe a little bit different than young guys struggling in spring training. When you look at guys that are fighting for roster spots, guys that maybe even trying to make triple A from double A, uh, you see them start to press, you see them start to struggle. That can be worrisome, I feel like. But with veterans, you know, I remember I remember I brought up stories of like Zach Granke training. He used to get shelled from time to time because he would go out there and throw fastballs or he would tell people what he was throwing. Uh, James Shields a couple of times would throw like change up after change up after change up. You're working on stuff. Um, and with Seth Lugo, who is notorious for throwing strikes, the fact he struggled with command a little bit, I'm sure he was trying to get guys to bite on a lot of the stuff he was throwing, working with some location stuff. But I'm sure he would tell you, not happy with the way things went. He's not going to walk away and say, oh, hold on, I gave on because I wasn't even trying. It's not that. I'm sure he was still trying to toss a, a good outing there. He was trying to fine-tune his craft. And – you kind of just chalk it up and say, this is what veterans do. Veterans are going to have their off days. They're going to have starts where it doesn't look that good. Uh, but that was kind of my main takeaway from Lugo, a guy that the Royals signed to be their number three in the rotation, maybe the number two, uh, depending how things go, depending how things shake out. But the fact that he struggled with command makes me think he was working on some things and not so focused on just, hey, I want to have a very clean three innings here where I'm striking out a lot of guys. It's just what Cole Reagans did. I'm sure he likes to carry the torch there, but you know, it's not a good start. It, it wasn't a good outing, but uh, not losing any sleep about it. And Michael Walker, same thing, went two innings, gave up a run. Uh, he was supposed to go three, but Daniel Lynch was already warming up. I believe they were saying in the second inning. So it's like, just get Daniel Lynch out there so he can get some innings in there. And, Daniel Lynch wasn't throwing very hard, about 90 to 92 from what David Lesky was saying on his Twitter. Uh, And follow him again at at DB Lesky. I want to get all the shout outs to great Royals accounts out there that do fantastic work and and provide content like that. But see, with the veterans, that's what I take away uh, from any of these guys, too, like Salvador Perez. Uh, Salvador Perez could hit really well or really poor, and I, I don't really buy too much stock into it. Uh, Hunter Renfro, he's barely played, hasn't gotten a hit yet. He's been on base, but it's like I'm not overly concerned about it, right? Adam Frazier, Garrett Hampson, these are veterans. They've been around the block. But you do like to see the younger guys play pretty well. It's fun to see Bobby Wood Jr. leave the yard twice in a weekend. MJ Melendez, who we just talked about in the first segment. You know, even Vinny. Vinny's saying he feels great. He feels healthy. The numbers aren't there in spring training right now. But you kind of get that veteran mentality in spring i want to work on things i want to make sure that i'm getting everything you know knocked down i want to make sure that i'm getting everything leveled out smoothed out before the regular season and with the pitchers that's very specific uh that's exactly what they want to do more than having a great spring having great numbers they want to make sure they feel comfortable when they're leaving surprise that hey we've been down here for a month you know, I, I wanted to work a little bit more on this pitch. That's important with somebody like Brady Singer or Jordan Lyles. You know, guys that are needing that bounce back. Reagans, Lugo, and Waka were all good last year. So for them, it's just let me iron out some things. I want to make sure I'm 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 getting my wind up down to a science. You know, my my plant foot feels comfortable off the mound. You know, when I'm following through, I've got good balance. You now those are all very off the top of my head saying, as I'm sure you're gathering and listening to this, but those starts are going to happen. So for, for those out there that might've bought too much stock into it or were excited about the 12 scoreless inning streak, don't Um, spring training is so funky and weird. Like the Royals, as I mentioned with their record, with some of their numbers in previous years, they were really good, but it's also not to say that if they're good in spring, they're going to be terrible in the regular season. Like Baltimore right now is nine and one. Baltimore is going to be really good in the regular season. The Dodgers are eight and three. They're going to be really good. But then the Rockies are seven and three, and they're not going to be very good. 
Oakland beat Texas today. That's not going to happen many times this season. So it's, it is really the most obscure and improbable and you cannot put your finger on it. You can't put your thumb on it. You don't know what to take away from spring training. Like, I, I try my best to and choose what matters and what doesn't. I, I guess stat lines really don't. Stuff does. If Lugo was hit 96 and he got rocked for five runs and command wasn't very good, well, I'll take away the 96 over the runs. Uh, if Cole Reagans, right, if Cole Reagans had three scoreless innings, but he was throwing 95-96 and he only struck out one, I'd be a little bit more concerned. I'd be like, why is the velocity dipping? Why is this happening? I, that's the best way I think I can approach it with starters. Like, I'd rather you have a bad outing, but the stuff looks good, or you can you can still believe in the stuff, than not having a great outing, but not getting roughed up. Like, that's the funny thing about Sunday's game. Michael walking up a run in two innings and nothing special. Like, Daniel, Win- Daniel Lynch went out there and threw over two innings, walked a couple, only struck out like one or two, and he was sitting 90 to 92. I don't feel good whatsoever about that outing from Daniel Lynch because the velocity is not there, and he can't be in this rotation, as we've mentioned, without good velocity. So for Lugo, five runs, couple of walks, but you're hitting 96. I'll look at the 96. I'll highlight that a little bit more. For Daniel Lynch, a better line, but I'm going to highlight the velocity there, the lack of strikeouts. That's, I think, how you can approach uh, some of the starters' outings is the training. Okay, before we move on to our final segment, I want to give a shout out to Locked On Sports today. It's here for you 24 7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports today now, available on the free Fire TV channels app. When we return, I'm going to tell you why the Royals are not signing these guys. And it's not going to happen, barring any unforeseen changes. We'll dive into that next on Lockdown Royals. You are tuned into Lockdown Royals on the Lockdown Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. Be sure to give me a follow on Twitter or X at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 1-5. Before we move on to our final segment, want to give a shout out to Game Time. It's where I go to buy all of my tickets. As I mentioned last week, we're only going to have shows Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all coming in the morning. And then I will not be having a show Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Monday. I'll be out of town. I'll be in Dallas. So won't have my stuff, won't have my equipment. And rather than trying to figure out good connection stuff, uh, just not going to be back for a little bit of time to do a podcast episode. But then we'll stretch into the weekend, the week I do get back. So we'll get those five episodes. But the reason I'll be down there, be visiting some family, but also going to a concert on Thursday. And you guessed it, I bought my tickets over at game time. I was just delivered my opening day tickets. As we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we're about three weeks away, just under, or just under four weeks away, excuse me, a little over three weeks away from opening day. Go buy your tickets, but why not get some money off with buying those tickets? Use our code of locked on for $20 off. So here's exactly what you need to do after listening to this podcast go and download the Game Time app, create the account, and use code locked on for $20 off on your first purchase. Those terms apply. So again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Well, I feel like it was the right way to start off this week, the right way to go about my segment planning with hitting on the the games. I think hitting on the games was at the top of my list. What happened? How those starts go? Which players stood out? Bobby Wood Jr., MJ Melendez, Nick Prado really pulled the show. Uh, Nick Lofton also was very impressive. Kyle Isbell had a good weekend. So some of these guys I wanted to highlight. Then I wanted to pivot to some of the questions I was getting. You know, I didn't really have a chance to be as responsive as I, as I usually am during the week. This weekend was very busy, caught up in a lot of stuff, so I didn't always have the chance to respond in a timely manner. But one of the breaking news stories of the weekend was that Matt Chapman went to the Giants on a three-year deal, I believe it was, $18 million a year. And I was getting some questions of, you know, one of them that comes to mind. So it's a little bit of an extension of a mailbag Friday, if you will. Uh, One of the questions was, if the Royals are serious about contending for the Central, why don't they go out there and give J.D. Martinez a one-year deal or go give Jordan Montgomery a deal with some opt-outs? And 
I, I look at those two players and I also look at where the Royals are at. Number one, let's state the obvious. I mean, the Royals have spent by their standards a lot of money. Okay, they've also extended their superstar in Bobby Wood Jr. Although we're now in this mindset of, hey, money's going to be flowing. Might as well spend a lot of money. Don't just spend a little bit of money. The Royals believe in what they got right now. Like, I don't think the Royals are, at this point in spring training, still wanting to add a top-end big-name guy like Blake Snell or like Jordan Montgomery. I never thought they'd be interested in Cody Bellinger. There were rumors they were interested in Matt Chapman. I just think they liked Michael Massey a lot and thought he was going to bounce back. And if they got Chapman for $18 million a year, I mean nearly $20 million for a guy that I personally do not believe is worth that type of price over the age of 30, you're moving Michael Garcia to second base. But I also understand, like, the Giants paid for him. The Giants missed a couple of free agents. Makes sense there. It's a great fit there. And Matt Chapman is a very good player. He's always going to be, you know, a – a four war guy or above. I mean, that's very valuable over at third base. And he hits the ball incredibly hard. He's got a lot of talent. Nobody can deny that. But for the Royals, I just, I guess I never really saw the fit. And with Jordan Montgomery, like there's a reason he's going this long without signing. He's at an asking price right now that nobody wants to meet. And he's coming off a really good year. Let's not get that mistaken, but is he worth 25 million a year? And my you know, uh, I guess my notes that I'd go back to with the Royals and Jordan Montgomery of a type of deal. Like I, I think the the projected contract that I saw recently was seventy five million over three years. So you're looking twenty five million, probably a couple of opt outs included there. So if you're the Royals and you look at what you sign for your rotation, Walker and Lugo were both sub twenty million. Right, I think Lugo was exactly at 15 million and Waka was 16, if I'm not mistaken. And then remember Marcus Stroman for what he signed for. Like it was a little bit less than I thought, but that to me showed for as interested as the Royals were in Stroman, they were not going to that mark. They were not going to go and meet that asking price for Marcus Stroman. Now, Jordan Montgomery is better than Stroman coming off a better year, but I just don't think they look at, at Jordan Montgomery. I don't think Montgomery looks at the Royals and says that's the perfect fit. There are a reason, there is a reason why the big spending teams still are like, we're not going for Jordan Montgomery. We're not giving him that contract because they're going to wait. It's, it's kind of just a, a classic old Western here. It's just who's going to blink first? Who's going to draw first? Who's going to have the quickest hand? And Jordan Montgomery is willing to wait it out. But see, that's also hurting him a little bit because he's not getting acclimated to a team. He's not really having his arm built up in some spring training games. Of course, he's working out. But there's just some teams that aren't jumping the gun. They're waiting and waiting and waiting. And that's happened with a lot of Scott Boris free agent guys. I mean, Cody Bellinger waited a little bit. Chapman waited a little bit. I know not everybody's with Scott Boris, but it's typical for Scott Boris free agents, the ones that are the last there, last of it. They don't sign for a while because they set their asking price and they usually don't drop it down that much. And the last guy, which I feel like I just have to put it to bed because on YouTube, Twitter, feels like every other day I'm getting a question about Trevor Bauer. It's not going to happen, okay? I I could maybe be wrong. I, I think anytime you have a scenario like this, never say never. Like, I'm never going to lock it in 100%, but I'm fairly confident that it's not going to happen in Kansas City. And for those out there saying, why not? Why is it happening? Well, just look at the rest of Major League Baseball, right? Trevor Bauer goes on a podcast and says, I'll play for the league minimum. Just give me a chance. Nobody even bit. Nobody even sniffed at it, really. I mean, everybody just carried about their spring training. And more than just what happened or what did not happen off the field, the, the distraction, as, as some would say, or the clubhouse issues, or not being able to get along. The baseball numbers here are laid out, I think, pretty simply. He hasn't pitched in the big leagues in two years. That is noticeable to teams. Okay? He just turned 33. That is noticeable to teams. Yes, he did win a Cy Young. It was also in a COVID year, if I'm not mistaken. So not over the course of a full year. Still a very good pitcher. I remember him very well in Cleveland. I remember him very well in Cincinnati. I remember him very well in L.A. for the 20 starts he was there. 
But I think more so than anything, what's going against him is, is some of these baseball numbers. Like he was good over in Japan. He wasn't unstoppable. And the talent level, it, it's a big jump over in the States. Everybody knows that. We've seen guys that are stars over in Japan and not be able to make it that long when they jump over to the States. So for Trevor Bauer, for a lot of people that say, I don't get it. Like it's a league minimum deal. Just do it. It's no harm, no foul. Even somebody said he'd be the second best pitcher in the rotation for the Royals. I think he'd be right there with Brady Singer at this point, maybe above, but that's, again, it's so unknown because we haven't seen him pitch in the bigs in two years. Like 2021 was the last time he threw a big league pitch. He's 33. And for a lot of teams, that's going to be enough to, to make them stay away. Now, unless you are just setting records over in Japan, like Yamamoto, or like Roki Sasaki, or like Tanaka was, or Otani, or Ichiro, you no, know, all those guys, Matsui, you, you look at what is expected of American players over there. A lot of them go there at the tail end of their career or when they can't make it in the bigs anymore. I'm not saying it'll never happen. I, I would say it's very, very unlikely it happens in Kansas City. But when a guy throws out, I'll play for the league minimum. Just give me a chance and nobody even blinks. I just don't see it happening. So if that's the last time I have to address it, that's probably what I'll stand on. If I have to bring it up again, I guess I will if I keep getting those questions over and over again. But for today, that'll do it for another edition of Lockdown Royals on the Lockdown Podcast Network. I've been your host, Jack Johnson. Be sure to give me that follow on Twitter at J underscore 15 and catch us on wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and we're also on YouTube. Just hit that follow button and subscribe. One last shout out to Locked On Sports today. It's here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports today now, available on the free Fire TV channels app. Tomorrow, we're probably going to spend a little bit more time on where this roster stands at this point. Are there any guys I'm not as high on anymore, guys that I think are rising? We'll have plenty of time to dive into that in a Tuesday episode. But until then, you take it easy, Kansas City.